I welcome to the stage our next panel, uh, which will be moderated by Dr. Burton Lee, who's the managing partner of Innovarium Ventures. And joining him on stage will be Jim Ball from Kennedy Space Center, Esther Dyson, and uh, Bob Richards from Odyssey Moon. So if the panelists just want to come up and yep. join the couches, and we'll get started. Where's Jim Ball? Lovely. Great. Well, it's good to be back at New Space. My name is Burton Lee. I'm based here in Silicon Valley. Uh, the work I do at Innovarium Ventures, I work with angel groups around the globe, venture capital funds, uh, private equity firms, as well as federal S&T agencies and national governments in the broad area of <coughs> innovation policy and innovation systems and organizations. Uh, and then I also teach entrepreneurship and innovation at Stanford in the engineering school. Uh, we'd like to introduce our panelists today. Jim, do you want to give a brief introduction? Jim Ball from the uh, NASA Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and I serve as the program manager for strategic partnerships. Uh, pretty engaged down there, have been for several years in our effort to um, uh, work with and, and help grow the commercial space industry. I'm Esther Dyson. I am a, on the board of XCOR. Sorry, I'm an investor in XCOR Aerospace and Space Adventures. I'm also a trained cosmonaut, but unfortunately one of the many who got trained and never flown. So like many of the people here, I'm investing in the industry to make it happen. And uh, I'm Bob Richards, and I guess in order of appearance, I'm one of the founders of SEDS, a proud advocate of the Space Frontier Foundation, a founder of the International Space University, um, founder of Singularity University, and the CEO of Odyssey Moon Limited, which is competing for the Google Lunar X Prize. And Bob, you're based out of Canada, right? Not according to my family. <laughs> okay. All right. But we do have a little bit of an international perspective yes. from yes, Europe, I am. Right? I okay, am as a, well as I am a Canadian. I, I admit it. Yes. Great. Okay. Um, well, the scope of the panel, the t types of things we'll be addressing is, uh, you know, where is space business going? What's the overall landscape? What's the marketplace for space business looking like? Alan has addressed some of those issues. I think you'll see a bit of overlap and convergence and agreement with some of what Alan's saying and what we'll be covering today. Uh, essentially, proposed framework for discussion for thinking about the, the space market and industry. Uh, if you think about demand side, supply side, and then support for entrepreneurs. Um, briefly give an overview of major market categories and trends. Uh, supply side, current deal flow, who's seeing what out there. I'll be giving a little bit of uh, uh, an update on where eSpace from Colorado stands. There's some interesting new data there, which I think will be of great interest uh, from the deal flow side, uh, startup side uh, here in the US. Uh, and then in terms of support for entrepreneurs, we'll be hearing uh, from all of the panelists on different sources of capital support, whether it's equity or non-dilutive. And then uh, on the eSpace side, we'll be uh, briefly addressing the incubation. Diane could not be here today, unfortunately, due to a last-minute family emergency. So I'll be presenting uh, the slides she was intending to present. Uh, briefly, this is uh, a, a framework for thinking about the space marketplace, which we first developed uh, back in 2007 as part of my work with Space Angels Network. Um, this is not complete by any means, but it's, it's, I think it's a useful way for understanding the major market category segments and looking at them relative to other major uh, investment opportunities, markets in the broader aerospace area. Uh, so here on the, let's see, where's the laser? Is there a laser attached to this? Guess not, okay. So here you have on the upper right, uh, satellite applications. Here we've grouped commsats, nav, imaging, asset tracking, environment, space, weather. Okay. Which button? It didn't apply to QC. Nope. All right. Um, in the, the green yellow boxes are more on the aviation side, just for points of reference. Uh, UAVs, of course, everyone understands what that means. Asian aviation essentially is China and, and India. SATMS, Space Air Traffic Management Systems, Next Gen, uh, major infrastructure programs. On the lower left-hand side, again, this is a log scale in terms of market size. Uh, space tourism, orbital services, small sats, space technologies, large category. The 
axis, the y-axis is perceived investor risk. And I think uh, perceived investor risk has changed a bit in the last year due to the success of Falcon 1, Falcon 9, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've moved orbital services, and this would include uh, some of what Alan was addressing. Um, actually, uh, he mentioned a $10 billion market figure for orbital services by 2025. Um, we placed it you know, annually on the one billion range, sorry, low billions. Uh, I definitely would agree that that could probably uh, move to the right a bit. Um, space tourism probably will still remain on the lower end of the overall market spectrum. Uh, small sats is, is up for discussion. Under space technologies, we've included the broad category of dual use as well as SBIR. So under sat apps, this includes in both the, the $100, million, $100 billion ComSat market that Alan just referred to as well as other $100 billion markets aggregated, again, trillion dollar order of magnitude. Uh, major market trends, <clears throat> again, coming back to the, the BITS theme, which, which Alan raised, space information technology convergence, the integration of telecoms and imaging, location-based services, mobile platforms, mobile imagery mapping uh, are going to drive a, a lot of ongoing purchase of data services, use of GPS, uh, commercial weather observation systems, still an out, an, a, a question for debate in, in Washington, D.C. as to whether uh, commercial organizations will replace the, the government NOAA services, asset tracking and satellite RFID applications, uh, businesses that have been in incubation for quite a while still are, really haven't reached the marketplace uh, in terms of major uh, uh, entry points, still looking for investment, have not yet found that anchor tenant. And then environmental sensing, climate change, uh, a big gorilla potentially in the box, uh, which may emerge depending upon uh, different national legislation approaches to carbon trading, carbon caps, that, that sort of thing. Space aviation uh, also is driving uh, the, the move here uh, on the IT side. And then US government procurement, LEO transportation, we're all familiar with, with the discussions in that area, small sats, research and SBIR programs, space tourism. And I do include prize competitions also as a driver of demand here now, becoming quite significant. Um, and just a brief overview of what could be happening uh, perhaps in Europe before the U.S. in terms of you know, environmental monitoring, carbon monitoring as an emerging market for uh, satellite applications as well. Again, very dependent upon which way the regulatory landscape uh, moves. So uh, I'd like to first ask Bob, could... Um, give his overview of what you view as the space market from Odyssey Moon's perspective, the global picture. Uh, feel free to reject, uh, come, come up with your own paradigm, present your own view of, of space, and we need to bring up the slides for Odyssey Moon that Bob Richards has. Hello, everyone. It's really nice uh, to be here again at, at New Space. And, you know, the, <laughs> as, as Alan was mentioning, the, you know, developing an ecosystem to try to perform a business in, in space isn't easy, as many of us in the audience here know. And uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about sharing our experiences of uh, being kind of out there on the front lines. Um, those of us that have crystallized some of our own ideas of what may work um, don't have much to point to that did work yet because we're all in the process of creating our businesses. But in the experience of, uh, of, of Odyssey Moon, just wanted to share with you a little bit. Um, oops, I don't need to know how to do this. Uh, what I view as the overall expanding the economic sphere of Earth, and many of the businesses that Burton was talking about fall in this realm of some case. And what I've done is I've, I've kind of put a timeline on this and a magnitude scale in the singularity perspective of exponentials and, and how we as a species are really increasingly moving away from our, our planetary surface, which has constrained us as a kind of a two-dimensional species until this point. We really are a three-dimensional species. And if you look at the timeline of, of freeing ourselves from gravity, um, not too literally and not too specifically, and you could calculate better metrics than this perhaps, but in general, if you look at the timeline from the 1900s and the uh, arrival of private aviation, it, it took us up to something like the, you know, the 20, 30 kilometers of being able to get there, and, and, and commercial activity started to take place. 
And, and nothing much happened until about the 1960s when the communication satellites, the commsats, were introduced. And, and we jumped up uh, over an order of magnitude into the realm of geocircuit satellites. And today, you know, 40, 50 years later, a very mature business, $1.6 billion or so of, of revenue flows through this economic sphere of Earth located in this geocircuitous Clark-type orbit. And, and when you look, if you look at where all the private capital is getting clustered right now, it's really all around the, the space tourism, all those big red dots where everybody's really focusing in. That really is, as Alan was saying, a, a near-term economic sphere. Uh, what I'm looking at is the next step. I think I had a box above the ones that you described, Burton, that wasn't there. It's in the $100 million realm to do exploration. So that's a box, I mean, it's, it, that's even higher risk. <laughs> it's even higher risk. So it's in that realm of that red dot up there in the far right, where Odyssey Moon and some others, how many here are competing for the Google Interact Prize? Um, or involved in teams, see a number of us, right? Thank you, <laughs> Will, yeah, yeah, you're included. Um, we're, we're up there, we're trying to st you know, put the stake in the next island in our planetary archipelago, right, of our economic sphere of space. And that's even a higher risk opportunity. Now, it's also a higher reward opportunity because once we establish that beachhead and we come up with the economic dipoles, how limited and uh, they may be at the beginning, um, we want to draw, we want to draw this venture capital that's clustered around low Earth orbit outwards, right? So as, as NASA does the hard stuff, right, creates our starships, you know, we can create these, these pathways with partnerships and private sector investment and commercial companies that create this routine type of activity. You know, if, I don't know anybody in a business who starts something to do something once, right? I mean, if, it's, if you're doing something once, it's likely a government. If you're doing something more than once, it's likely a business. And so the idea is in routine, in replication, in doing things more than once, and for economies of scale. So that's really the, the idea of you know, the, 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 the X Prize and why all of us are really inspired to try to reach outwards one more order of magnitude beyond our current economic sphere. And a lot of us involved in the Google Inter X Prize, it really is trying to put that stake in the ground uh, of our next planetary neighbor, uh, which is achievable. It's not that far away. Someday. Hopefully Odyssey Moon and others will be landing frequently on the lunar surface, uh, delivering payload services, data services, entertainment services, who knows what you know, the actual business plan is going to be that does it. But we've got all of these ecosystems developing and I'm really excited to be at this frontier. So that's a quick overview of, of what I see as expanding the economic sphere of Earth and that's what it's all about. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Our next speaker will be Jim Ball from KSC, who will give, him, give us an overview of what KSC is doing in this area. Thank you. Which, which one is right this for? Thank you, Burton. Um, really delighted to be asked to be a part of this panel. Uh, although you might you might wonder what is a what does a spaceport have to do with with capital and and. Uh, launching new entrepreneurial ventures and that sort of thing. Well, it you know, has a lot to do with it, um, frankly. If you, I, I will tell you that Kennedy Space Center amidst a lot of uncertainty over the last uh, year or so has been moving out very robustly to plan for a new direction and paradigm uh, for both NASA and the commercial space industry. And I think what will resonate with you, although I can't offer to bring any capital to your ventures and I can't say that we're going to develop new space markets for you. Uh, we do have a fundamental role to play in making you successful, and, and we see that as being an enabler. Now, what I believe will resonate with, with you folks is the, the notion of a, of a culture change and a paradigm shift that indeed has been underway at KSC for some time. Uh, First, a, a, a perspective uh, that we share, I think, with many people across the industry, and this, this won't come as a shock to, to anybody in this audience, but it's, it's useful to take a look at how important low-cost, reliable access to space is and the interdependency with space markets, because they're absolutely connected at the hip. Um, what, what I've chosen to show here are emerging commercial space markets, some of which have already uh, begun to take root 
not the traditional commercial space market. Space has been open for business for decades. I mean, certainly since the telecommunications satellites first began flying. But what, what we're talking about it with a little more focus here is, is what are the things that are coming? What, what's on the horizon? Things like commercial and space services, uh, the private orbital labs and habitats represented by the folks like Bob Bigelow, uh, commercial human space flight in and, and all of its various forms, which is much more, I agree with the other speakers this morning, that it's not just space tourism, but it's commercial space research carried out by individuals through commercial human space flight and other applications. And though we're not talking a lot about it yet these days, there, are, there is a pretty strong constituency of people that believe at some point uh, commercial uh, space-based power is going to be important to the, to the Earth as well as to space enterprise as well. On the left-hand side there for commercial space transportation, uh, I've chosen to show just commercial space transportation because I think many of the concepts and principles that will lead to, commercial, to, to low cost reliable access to space are being pioneered not by NASA but by the commercial space industry itself. Things like putting an emphasis on, on recurring operating costs. Now at Kennedy Space Center, we for years have been, you know, been identifying things that could help lower recurring operating costs. But we weren't necessarily in the driver's car uh, of designing government space transportation systems. We were the end of the pipeline. We were everything came, went, went together and got launched. And so we didn't get listened to a great deal. Uh, but we, did, we do have 50 years of experience in, in knowing what it takes to operate systems and where some of the problems are. A year ago, um, this chart would not have had a question mark on it. And a year from now, I hope it's still not there. Uh, what you're seeing there is Complex 39, Pad B in the foreground, which had already been uh, converted in some uh, major ways for uh, the program of record. Uh, in fact, you see the Ares 1X vehicle sitting on the pad there. Uh, more distantly, pad A with a shuttle on it and down the beach, other complexes like 41 and 40, et cetera. Well, clearly one of the, one of the keys for a transformation of Kennedy Space Center is making sure that we're able to provide reliable access to launch property and associated services. And it should not only be reliable, but it needs to be affordable. Um, we are very engaged, as a number of the members of industry that are in this audience know, in working directly with uh, commercial space transportation companies to help us plan for what this transformation should be. Uh, not just these launch facilities, but the horizontal launch facilities represented by the shuttle landing facility. Our strategies are really pretty straightforward. Um, Transition the infrastructure and the capabilities so that the Kennedy Space Center and, and other uh, launch property in the neighborhood are able to support and actually enable multiple space transportation systems, uh, particularly operated by commercial space providers, but also those that may be operated by the government once the administration and the Congress decide you know, where we're going with that but also to apply our experience and expertise where we can and where it's useful to help overcome some of the technical hurdles that might be encountered and to indeed achieve the goal of recurring, of lower recurring cost. So our vision is to serve as both a flight test center and a prototype test bed that's integrated fully with day-to-day -day operations of, of commercial systems and operational systems. Our activities to kind of carry out those strategies have been primarily um, centered around these, these uh, simple ideas. One is develop partnerships with key stakeholders. Uh, I think uh, you'll, you'll agree um, in large measure that much, if not all of NASA, certainly, but much of NASA and KSC in particular has gone into a listen and learn mode as opposed to a more traditional NASA approach, which was broadcast mode. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll broadcast what we need, you bring it to us and, and, and we'll pay for it. I think now 
you know, at a Kennedy Space Center perspective, uh, we are listening to industry and making sure we understand what we hear. Uh, putting on opportunities for industry to come to us where we can learn, but we're also going out to industry at, at their home and finding out and learning what it is they really need from us. Opening the facilities, as I've said, and, and also applying our technical expertise uh, where it's wanted and where it can be useful and where it's cost effective for industry to use it. Here's a great example of one of the partnerships we formed with our stakeholder uh, and our partner, Space Florida, the state of Florida, to begin building what we believe will be a commercial space cluster at Kennedy Space Center and not just necessarily limited to, to commercial space activities, but other technology areas as well, such as clean energy and, and automation and robotics and other, other areas of science and technology that intersect with space. Over time, we believe that this campus will emerge, which will be the ideal location for international business. Uh, as you've heard about the interest in an international market for commercial human space flight, it's, it's not going to be just that. But as we are able eventually to move beyond uh, Earth orbit and begin to have commercial enterprise involved in translunar transportation and lunar uh, resource use, and even beyond the, the moon to other near-Earth uh, opportunities. This harbor that we've all come to know as Kennedy Space Center and this particular park and other capabilities we hope to build there will be ever more important to those enterprises. And so in conclusion, I think we have a formula that we, we believe is not only going to be useful and, and, and successful for us, but we think too for the commercial space industry. And that is if you look around the planet and say how many places are there really uh, that offer the access to the frontier of space given the technology of transportation that we have today. And given that there are places that are going to be building um, spaceports that offer suborbital access, uh, some of which may even offer orbital access, but looking around the globe, it's, it's our sincerest belief that none of the options that are available today uh, can match the diversity, the accessibility, and the opportunity for growth and experience that we have at Kennedy's. Uh, we're, we're known worldwide for our famous launches, but not as many people recognize Kennedy Space Center as the inventive uh, place that it is in, in the center of innovation. We're often among the very top of NASA's uh, centers in terms of new patents, new technologies reported, that sort of thing. And so uh, we believe it's, um, it's not rocket science. We think it's good business. And we're, we're very much um, at the forefront, we believe, in transforming uh, KSC to a new paradigm and direction that's going to support uh, commercial space, help the United States become more competitive globally, and uh, accelerate the day when we can all get into space. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, you raised some interesting points. Uh, Transportation systems are particularly difficult for private sector financing in part because of the high infrastructure costs, building out of highways, spaceports, airports. So that's a very clear role where governments uh, can make an important contribution to bringing uh, new industries into play. And clearly the federal government through NASA uh, and the Air Force, KSC, Vandenberg, elsewhere, uh, have the potential for making major contributions. And I think uh, probably Elon Musk might say that, that the facilities and support that KSC's been given to SpaceX has been essential for uh, their success. Um, however, you also raised the issue of clusters, cluster developments. Uh, and the uh, question is, can clusters form only around spaceports? So New Mexico is also thinking about clustering uh, around Spaceport America. We currently have, I think, what you could call a commercial space cluster in the Los Angeles area. Um, Virginia Space Flight Authority is also looking at potential for cluster development around that spaceport. However, you don't always need a spaceport to create a commercial space cluster, and Colorado is very, one very good example of that. 
If you could please bring up the uh, Diane Demeff slides. Great. So Diane Demeff, as I mentioned, uh, could not uh, come today. She's the executive director of eSpace. This is a new player on the scene. I don't know how much of you know about what uh, Scott Tibbetts and Diane have been doing in Colorado for the past two years. Uh, essentially, they've opened up an incubator in, Bo in Boulder in conjunction with the University of Colorado. And this will be uh, perhaps the first time that uh, some of the early results of this incubator will, will be presented. And I think it's going to be quite interesting in terms of the major market categories. We'll see that many of the uh, companies that they've been looking at are not in the space transportation area, but in that category I broadly outlined, space technologies, dual use, SBIR. So the mission of eSpace is to support the creation and development of entrepreneurial space companies. So initially this was a spin out uh, from the former Starsys uh, subsidiary, um, where, where, which Scott Tibbetts headed up in, in Boulder for a number of years uh, to commercialize the technologies and to develop workforce. So this has been supported by the state of Colorado uh, from the beginning as part of the Economic Development Agency's efforts to develop a commercial space cluster and strong workforce to essentially diversify the existing space base in Colorado, which traditionally has been more focused on military and large aerospace. Um, they offer a large number of resources to entrepreneurs, funding, relationships, and what they call business elements, including office space and infrastructure, uh, managerial talent, workforce, on the uh, relationship side, they work very closely with various mentors, with various uh, venture capital groups, angel investors in the area. Then on funding, they also have direct access to seed grants, uh, which they can provide directly to companies in their incubator, as well as uh, facilitating introductions to the private equity venture capital community. And they have a very close relationship with the Air Force Research Lab SBIR office at Kirtland. So this is the basic process they use to assess companies. Essentially, they, they've had two uh, calls for applications up to now over the past year. Um, I won't go through this in, in detail, but uh, essentially what they do is they, they put out a call for applicants. Companies apply, and then they're selected or not uh, to be invited to uh, join the incubator. So um, what they've done is uh, I'm just going to forgo this, let's see, this is the, basically the, the key criteria they uh, use to identify companies, uh, viability both from a technical and uh, venture finance perspective, looking at the business plan. This is the key slide that I wanted to share with you. Um, during the past 18 months, they've, uh, as I mentioned, gone through two, uh, two rounds of applications. The first uh, received 30 applicants, second round 15 for a total of 45. Um, three were selected in the first round, six. So nine companies out of those 45 have been selected for incubation at eSpace. And remember, this, this, is, this is in Boulder, Colorado, far from a spaceport. Um, so the scope of the ventures, and this gets back to the broader space technologies category on the, on the lower left, you'll see a large number typically not from the space transportation or what we, we would talk about typically new space as commercial space or new space. Hardware and software, dual use, green, product services, and specifically, um, these are not all of the companies, but it's a good, ex good cross-section, tracking orbital debris, uh, spacecraft components, Google X Prize, more componentry, um, and then uh, again, a space data, so an IT play. So uh, part of the reason that they, the criteria they use to select these companies is they look at also what the Air Force and other space-focused SBIR programs are interested in in, in terms of topics, uh, and they use the SBIR program funding to the, leverage the uh, both the state grants and private equity um, private equity funding as well. So um, I cannot uh, unfortunately bring Diane here, but uh, I encourage all of you to contact eSpace uh, Diane or Scott Tibbetts directly. This is a very significant development in the commercial space area to see that they've got early success here in uh, both incubating companies. Now, they, they don't, they're not far enough along to talk about successes in terms of exits, uh, sales of the companies, M&As, IPOs, but getting companies in, getting them through the process, this is very positive development overall for the U.S. and international commercial space sector. Okay, next slide set is also going to be new data, the EC slide set first. Uh, for those of you who were uh, 
in the area on Wednesday. So what I'm going to do now is give a quick overview of a brand new player on the space scene, which is largely unknown to the United States space community. This is of potential interest to a broad range of U.S. space companies and, and universities interested in diversifying their sources of funding. Uh, this is not specifically commercialization focused funding, but it is a new source of funding out of Europe, uh, which is not, just to be clear, is not the European Space Agency based out of Paris. Last Wednesday, we invited the European Commission out of Brussels to give a half-day workshop at Stanford, uh, basically outlining the space research program, levels of funding, areas of interest, uh, issues of ITAR, uh, intellectual property. The slides will be available uh, mid to late next week on the European Commission website. For those of you who didn't attend, I see a number of folks in the audience who were there. Gary, Will, Jim, anyone else attended? Right, so a number of you were in the audience. Um, yes. And uh, again, this, this is a long-term, uh, you should take the long-term view here with regards to the European Commission. It can be quite labor-intensive, resource-intensive to develop relationships in Europe which would allow you to access European Commission funding, but it's something definitely to keep in mind uh, for the long haul and for organizations with, with larger uh, resource bases. So uh, I'm just gonna quickly go through uh, essentially, some of the key slides that Dr. Schulte Brax from the Commission in Brussels presented. He's the head of the Space Research Program Unit in Brussels. Uh, just a quick overview <coughs> of what the Commission is. This is the Pan European Government. Uh, don't know their annual budget, but it's in the hundreds of billions covering regional economic development, transportation systems, research, very wide range of services. So uh, this is the organization, the pan-European government that was formed in the late 1950s to take over uh, some of the national government functions and to provide a basis for eventual European integration. At this point, there are up to 27 member states, uh, with the exception of Switzerland, Norway, and the Southeast Asia area. You can see this is a very large entity. It's highly political uh, when you have 27 national governments involved trying to manage this thing. On the space side, uh, Two years ago, uh, the European Commission and the United States signed, uh, updated a, uh, the Science and Technology Cooperation Agreement and for the first time included space. So the European Commission's space budget is approximately uh, 200 million euros a year, so 1.4 billion over seven years. And their two main areas of focus are global monitoring of environment and security and strengthening space foundations. Now I'm gonna focus here just on the strengthening space foundations area because I think that's of most interest. So specific topics that they're, cons that they're interested in funding, and there is an RFP out of Brussels on the street now, re was released last Tuesday. Innovation launch propulsion technologies, science data and exploitation, science technologies and components. Again, uh, they are specifically looking for cooperation participants out of the United States, hence their visit to Stanford and Silicon Valley. Uh, they are interested also long-term in supporting research focused on inter interplanetary travel, uh, sample return, and data analysis handling processing from space missions. Now, some of the specific areas that they're funding now, and we expect they'll probably continue to fund in the near term, uh, are in the areas of space debris, uh, NEOs, for example, and then uh, space monitoring, and uh, also in general, their goal is to improve coordination and, and collaboration uh, globally in, in the space area. Um, space situational awareness, awareness from the European side, space weather, uh, very active but small program uh, focused on debris removal. Um, last year was the first year that U.S. organizations bid as part of European consortium and participated. So up to now, they have had seven successful proposals uh, involving U.S. partners, which are currently uh, in process. And on Wednesday, we had a uh, scientist, a professor, principal investigator from Ohio State University discussing their experience working as a member of a European consortium. So you can see a very broad range of projects, deorbiting, space weather, electrodynamic tethers. These funding levels can be quite significant. So here you see Colorado State has received 220,000 euros from the European Commission for this project. 
Uh, the other four are uh, basically in the area of atmospheric modeling, solar physics, again, space weather, and uh, more, uh, more of a science-focused project at the end there. Uh, as I mentioned, they have just issued a call this past Tuesday. Uh, the call, the funding levels available uh, for which U.S. organizations could participate is between 20 to 30 million euros. Uh, that amount is expected to go up, as you can see, in future years. Um, this program currently runs through 2013. It will uh, very likely be extended 2014 and beyond at, at higher funding levels. And some of the, uh, so this is what they've currently put in the current uh, RFP. You see uh, robotic and space propulsion, uh, mobile rovers. This was why we invited the XPRIZE Foundation. Uh, NEOS is also an area where the European Commission is hoping to stake out some turf and essentially develop an international consortium, Russia, US, Europe, uh, and uh, essentially develop uh, longer term collaborations focused on mitigation of near Earth objects. And then CubeSats and NanoSats were also an area of, uh, of interest. Uh, proposals are due by November 25. And future areas uh, where the European Commission expects to be active are space and climate change, natural disasters, environment, planetary robotics, survival, and again, space transportation and future space propulsion technologies. Some of these areas, maybe many of them, raise ITAR issues. We did not explicitly discuss ITAR. Uh, any institution considering proposing should obviously consult their uh, ITAR attorney and, and officials. So that's a quick overview of, of what we did on Wednesday. New funding source for uh, potentially for commercial applications. This is research focused, but you can use this funding to potentially leverage uh, in the way you you'd also do with SBIR funding, uh, private equity monies as well. So now we'll go into the broader Q&A. <coughs> Esther. I had 30 slides and a video, but if everybody promises to ask good questions, I will skip them. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll start off just by saying who I am and, and make two points, really. One is, I'd like to echo what Jim Muncy said this morning. The, the government, as well as the investors, are thinking so incredibly short term, and they're thinking short term in many cases about the wrong thing. I, I was lucky enough to be part of a small lobbying tour that went to visit various Congress people, and I'll be really vague about this, but it was, it was so depressing. Uh, they didn't want to know about anything other than how many jobs in my state before the next election will either be created or lost because of what you're proposing. That was it, absolutely. Nothing about education, nothing about the long term, nothing about science. Uh, so if you can do, build your companies, try not to rely on the government, but at the same time, to the extent you can, I don't know, go teach in your kids' schools, just go talk to show and tell, talk to your Congress people, uh, write articles in your local paper, but we've, we've got to change the atmosphere that is creating such an incredibly short-term government, let alone a market which seems to be more driven by stock prices than by real accomplishments. And with that, I don't know, do you want to ask us questions or have the audience ask questions or what's going to happen? Is this mic on? No, it's not. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Yep. So uh, just to clarify, my presentation of this material from the European Commission is not intended to endorse government funding as the primary engine of commercial space growth and development. However, given the broader issues and reduction in um, venture capital and private, private equity in this country and the current pressures under which many angel invest, investors and angel groups find themselves, more and more startups broadly are beginning to look at SBIR and other other opportunities for non-dilutive grant funding from governments. Okay, well, let me disagree then, and then we can have a good panel, because it's, it's been a long, hard slog, but I, I'm really encouraged by what I've seen lately. Just things are beginning to open up. With, with luck, our government will stop investing. You know, it won't, it won't do these crazy cost-plus contracts. It will simply buy stuff. 
And that's absolutely the best kind of money you can get. It's not a grant. It's what you need is good customers who buy stuff that works. And if it doesn't work, they won't buy it. That's your problem to figure out. And competitive markets will help the good ones win and go on to good, do good stuff. And that, I think, is going to happen in the next year or two. What the market needs is more visibility, more transparency, uh, more companies buying from one another. This has been an industry of independent silos that weren't visible and therefore nobody was encouraged to come in. They were, they were close to outsiders and I think that's changing. So I'd focus more on getting good at marketing and of course getting good at what you're doing. If I could reinforce the disagreement just a little bit, Burton? A lot, please. Um, you know, I've, I've done both sides of it, Burton. You know, I've, you know what, you're an entrepreneur when you wake up and you're worried about how the hell you're gonna make payroll right next month or how you're gonna pay the rent. You know, working on, a, on an SVIR in Canada, you know, wh where, whatever country you're in, you're in a cost plus situation, what you do, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with coming up with a business that, a business plan where you sell your smarts or your labor for, or rent your engineers on the hour to some government agency or some, you know, but, but what you're doing is you're subordinating your dream and your, your aspirations to the requirements of a large organization that doesn't necessarily share that. So you become not a puppet, but you become responsible, right, to that model. You know, I went, I was lucky enough to be involved in a Mars mission. You know, one of my dreams, being sparked by Carl, I've, I, Carl Sagan, I blame him way long ago, you know, was to get to Mars. And, you know, Chris, we, you know, your mission manager on that uh, Phoenix Mars mission, and I was lucky enough to put one of the little barnacles that NASA put a lander under to send to Mars, and we had a great time. But I did that under a cost plus scenario through Canada. You know, and, and, and the process turned what my company sold every day for $30,000 into a $30 million thing. You know, and, as, and, and as, as thrilled as I was to participate in that magnificent, at least for the Canadians discovered snow on another planet, I mean, how appropriate. I mean, that was kind of fun, right? But um, that was cool. But, but I also feel like it was, it was wrong for me. And, and, you know, it was great to be the leader of the Optech Space Division for those 10 years and wonderful, but you know, I left because what I want to do is I want to not create a $30 million barnacle out of a $30,000 product. I want to see a $30,000 product become a, you know, at, not more than one magnitude, <laughs> at least more expensive to send it to space. So, you know, I want to do the hard way, right? I want to do the marketing. I want to send my Cupid's arrows into the hearts of people like Esther and, and let them know that, that I'm going to pull this off. And it's going to be not by subordinating myself to that type of infrastructure, but carving out new areas, and it's all about persistence and perseverance, and we will get there. If you don't, we will get there. There are people that will back us and do this. This is a, um, could be a very long discussion. I have something to add, but I wanted to see if Jim had any thoughts here. Well, I, I think this is not a, a, a topic um, a, a, or debate that is particularly germane to, to government. Um, injecting itself into you know I think I think our role is to be a good customer uh, SBIR is a is a congressionally mandated uh, expenditure of agency R&D funds which frankly does uh, if it's invested and in, in, in targeted properly uh, help to stimulate new commercial businesses and you know it's going to be spent anyway so we ought to we ought to put a lot of thought into what are the deployment of those dollars that have the best potential for generating uh, new economic activity, commercial, commercial applications. Uh, and, and certainly within government, I think you find a lot of, of folks within NASA that are engaged in the SBIR program thinking along those lines is where, where can we deploy some of these dollars to be supportive of commercial space and, and help to grow the industry. It, you know, if you're, if you're of a business mindset that you don't want to avail yourself to that, that's okay. You, know, there, you do it however you want to do it, but the, the fund is there, so I'm going to join your side of the debate, I think, <laughs> and say, you know, it is, it is a source of capital for new business creation that should not be ignored. 
let me give some additional data points. I serve yeah, as let, a, Let's do some Q&A from the audience because we're almost going to run out of time. Uh, yes, but this is an important point uh, to come back to. <laughs> uh, I serve as a SBIR reviewer for both the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. And SBIR grants, particularly from the NIH, are an extremely important source of non-dilutive uh, grant funding for up-and-coming drug and medical device companies. Extremely important. And many venture capital firms, angel investors, look at SB NIH grants as a very good form of technical due diligence uh, that has been done on particular technologies. So that said, I fully support and agree that government procurement policy should be very commercially, totally commercially focused in this area, that that's a very important vehicle for government support for commercial space. I also support, Bob, your argument that you need to be careful if you do go after government monies, you, you can subordinate your entire mission, staff, structure to just fulfilling government requirements. You have to be very, very careful if you go down that road. Now we're going to open up Q&A to the audience. Um, was that a question back there? So far there's been, and this is not a criticism of anybody here, but um, there's been a lot of smoke around commercial space and not a lot of um, delivery on things, at least. If you look at Virgin Galactic, it was supposed to be flying in 2007. It's now t still about two years away. And there's other examples. How, how important is it that they start actually delivering, and what do you think the environment will be for funding once they do? Um, so I, I come out of the PC business and the internet and all that stuff, and, and there it always takes 10 years for the year of whatever to actually happen. You know, there was the year of the land, the local area network, then there was the year of mobile, and each of those things took sort of a decade to happen. So I, I would say, don't give up hope yet, whether it's Virgin Galactic or somebody else. I think it's going to happen pretty soon now, uh, which sounds <laughs> really lame, but it's, it's exactly when everybody kind of gives up hope and says, yeah, I've, I've been reading that, that for eight years, what's happening, that in fact it will start to happen. So it will be really important when it does, because then real money will flow in, uh, suddenly you know, I said you should get more marketing minded, but you don't want to get more marketing minded when you don't have a product to market. But when we have a bunch of people who've gone up even suborbital and floated around, and then they can come back and go on TV, it's, it's going to be great not just for traditional marketing, but for PR and visibility and press. And uh, all these guys will be Twittering and we'll wonder why we ever doubted anything. It's a 10-year metric that is really real. It scares me a little bit because I don't want it to be 10 years. You know, when you look at a lot of things that have been done in the cycles, you know, zero G with Peter took like the 10 years, and from the first time thinking about an instrument for Mars to getting to Mars was 10 years. Odyssey Moon was 2007, so oh god. Um, <laughs> but sometimes it's seven years, right? There's the lucky seven, and but I do agree this 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 ominous 10-year cycle that seems to take place, so I'm hoping for the lucky seven or less. Um, for those of you who watch the broader Valley High Tech area, you, I'm sure you're aware of the Tesla IPO recently. Uh, I think the big question here is when is Elon going to do the SpaceX IPO? What's his metric? What's he waiting for? What are the market conditions? What type of uh, market valuation? That is going to be a key determinant, I think, a success point that many investors will, will look at that, that could change perceptions of, of this industry very broadly. Jim. There's a metric that's been thrown around uh, in terms of the venture community here in the Valley that, say, from the 2004 to 2008 timescale, uh, the venture capital <coughs> community who is looking for um, new markets to put their limited partners' capital, look to the biotech industry. The majority of the community weren't so informed about biotech and perhaps green tech and other new techs in uh, 2004. But by about 2008, one metric I've heard was that there was up to $4 billion 
vested from the venture community. Uh, Esther, you might correct me on the, the details. Now, this early this year, of course, um, Draper Fisher put in another 60 million into SpaceX. And although it's a, maybe only a single data point, do you think we're approaching that point uh, in time where this is going to start opening up and the venture community and the investment capital community will then look to new space projects uh, with uh, much more energy and vigor, uh, say beginning in the next six to 18 months for new ventures and uh, investment opportunities? I actually think that will take longer. They, they're really slow and it, it takes time for the returns to show up. Uh, you know, Steve Jurvetson himself is very different from DFJ, the firm, and the firm's, it's, it's going to take not just Elon's next IPO, but I think a bunch of other things to happen. But then, eventually it will. Right now, it's, it's hard to make the business case, honestly. It's, it's still a, a non-institutional kind of thing. Uh, Jim, you also need to keep in mind that the venture capital industry is shrinking in this country. Uh, and so the amount of capital available from U.S. and overseas limited partners here in the U.S. is going to be expected to be substantially reduced. Uh, I would point people to the um, Deloitte National Venture Capital Association study, which came out uh, about a month ago, which basically they did a, a, a survey of 500 VCs globally looking at Europe, Asia, Latin America, and the United States and venture capital. Uh, US and Europe are expected to substantially shrink, both in terms of numbers of firms and capital. Uh, it's through the emerging markets where you're going to see, so Brazil, India, China, where you're going to see growth of venture capital. So I, I think that will have a material impact on new space uh, as well. I, I would argue, though, that the, the macro numbers are, are less important. Um, and, and the other good thing about not a lot of VC is your competition can't raise money either. <laughs> and, and that's real. Uh, as this thing starts to happen, it's actually going to be really hard to hire people if, if too much money flows in. So what everybody needs to learn to be successful is how to manage better. Uh, I would say most of the companies, <clears throat> how do I say this politely? There, there's a lot of upside in developing good management and good marketing skills in this business. And to the extent that capital is scarce, the people who are good and get that capital will have fewer people competing with them. Uh, VC is maybe under pressure, but most things VCs put their money into don't need that much money anymore. Uh, anybody can go start a website. So it's, it's much easier now to do a startup in Silicon Valley. And the VCs are looking for cool new stuff to do. They just don't think space is it yet. Brian. Thanks, Burton. I'm Brian Barnett. I'm founder and CEO of a company called SatWest. I started SatWest 11 years ago, and this is just basically some of my experience, just, just a comment from having done that. So I'm a space advocate and went, always wanted to start a space business somehow. And so I saw an opportunity in, um, in space uh, com the communication satellites that were being launched 11 years ago. And I started the company because the biggest, the biggest markets that we had identified were um, for the um, asset monitoring and so forth. So Burton, you had that on your chart earlier today as one of, that was on your market chart. So I just wanted to point out that 11 years later, you know, that's pretty routine in, the, in my company now. We've been selling it for about maybe seven years, but but I mean, I thought it was going to happen immediately. <laughs> so I'm just pointing out it takes a long time, right? And so luckily we're still in business. Um, but now the technology is, the applications are there that we can actually sell. But when I first started the company in 99, well, guess what? Iridium went bankrupt. Global Star went bankrupt. ICO went bankrupt. Which other ones? <laughs> Every one of my suppliers and my business plan went bankrupt. I guess just the other, the other thing is um, um, that, uh, and they came out of bankruptcy, which enabled businesses like mine to 
survive and start selling the stuff that we had in our original business plan. The other um, point I just wanted to point out is that I was looking for VC early on and got, um, you know, got the stiff arm from everybody. Thank God, because I still own, I still own the company. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I've done it through bank financing, and and plus you have to have cash flow from day one. So I, I guess my another point here is that if you have an idea and you want to start a business, just do it. And um, but make sure you have cash flow, and then, you know, it, it won't be easy. But just get started, like Bob with his lunar odyssey and. And hopefully the, the financing will, will get come to you the type that you need. Well, Brian, thank I mean it's hard it's really hard, right? But everything in life is hard. So uh, those of us who really, really love space are, are gonna do that do that because that's that's hard, but everything in li life is hard. And the and sticking with it, there are people there, you know, the venture capital that you do need to do large missions, it's not there yet. But there are people who are passionate who who really want to have hands-on, you know. If you find the people who have some, I see Dave going, yes, yes, yes. You have the people who have some money, you know, and, but they also want to be involved and have a stake. They don't just want to write a check and let me, let me know when the ROI comes. You know, it's that ecosystem of people, you know. Sure, you can go out and start a university and 20 years later, there'll be people excited to work with you, right? But that's a long road too, right? No, there are people out there that are passionate about these opportunities. And, and climbing the ladder, valuation, and showing the milestones, and showing you have customers that have real money to pay, should you do that, um, hoping that, uh, hoping upon hope, that credible customers like NASA will provide the hooks, you know, the, to your business case that will help you along the way. There's no easy way to do it. Um, and it's, it's just a question of investing yourself, and not giving up, and not giving up, and not giving up. And one day, Something might happen, right, Dave? Exactly. Absolutely. David? Um, to what degree will the outcome of the FY11 budget and policy either make or break or just be neutral to the developing space industry? Did everyone hear that question? Can you use a mic? To what degree will the outcome of FY11's budget and policy conclusion, whatever that may be, make, break, or be neutral to the emerging and developing space industry? Uh, this, this question makes me so sad because it, it just seems to me so obvious that the president's budget, by and large, was the right thing, and it has been so badly promoted that it's it's just really, really sad for, for the planet, not just for the U.S. And I think it could be very positive uh, if it doesn't pass. I think commercial space will prevail anyway, but it's going to be much more difficult. And it, it just would be a huge, I, I mean, tell me, there must be so many people in NASA who know that they're doing stuff, they have nice jobs, they're doing interesting work, but people aren't stupid. They don't like to work on things that they know are pretty pointless. And I, I'm on NASA's advisory council. I run the technology and innovation subcommittee. Ironically, I'm also doing this thing in Russia about developing a Russian Silicon Valley. And in both instances, there are these people struggling to get free, both within bureaucracies and outside them. And there's just this system that is tragic. I, I think if I could answer the question directly, it, it, it's hugely impactful. On, I, I think that the whole issue is sort of framed in the, in the one image I had with the big question mark on Complex 39. I mean, you, you do not resolve what is going to happen until there's action on the FY11 budget one way or the other. And I don't know of anybody that really expects that we're gonna turn the clock back and somehow uh, proceed with what was euphemistically called the program of record unchanged. And so until, until you have a resolution of the policy and the budget uh, between the administration and the Congress, we, we really don't know what 
direction that NASA's headed. Although I will say that, that KSC um, moved out very quickly to embrace what they saw as the, as the direction that we were receiving from our national leadership, recognizing that that had to be uh, worked through the Congress, uh, authorized and funded by the Congress, and that there could be disagreements, as there obviously have been. So I know Mr. Cabana's point in talking internally to the workforce is commercial space is going to happen, whether it, whether it happens in a year or two years or five years. Or, this is a future paradigm change that is going to occur. Uh, I think it's probably in all of our best interest to get this issue resolved fairly quickly. And that as an, as an NASA person, uh, and, and certainly at KSC, we, we're prepared to make this culture change. We, we will even embrace it and help it and enable it because I think we all believe that we will be better off uh, in the long run by having made this transition and that it was necessary at some point. So anything that, that just extends out the, the old status quo is, is, is putting us more in jeopardy of not being able to turn the corner. David, I, I think just one response. Uh, there's a very important issue which, which has not gotten a lot, a lot of attention and that's the privatization commercialization of the NOAA weather system. I mean, this was an issue that was being looked at a year and a half, two years ago in Washington uh, under the prior administration. It's been put on hold for whatever reason. This is an important issue, so that NOAA should be moving to data purchase contracts, coming back to Esther's point that government, sound government procurement policies, taking operation, building, financing of these constellations out of government hands, putting it in the private sector, government purchases the data. Why isn't this something that the new space community is really paying attention to? This, this, that's a near, could be a major impact, uh, have a major impact on private sector investment uh, broadly in the commercial space, space arena, and no one's talking about it. <coughs> uh, next question. Yes, sir. So my name is Paul Masson. I'm not in the space business. I'm in the business of forming public-private partnerships. So my question to Bob. Given that you've been on both sides, do you have a, an idea, a model, a structure that can solve the business issues? Both well, getting, getting both the government capital, entrepreneurial capital, and could potentially deal with a little bit of the politics that the NASA professionals have to deal with. I'm in the middle of an experiment right now. And uh, uh, my company has a partnership, private-public partnership with NASA. Uh, through a reimbursable Space Act agreement, it's an experiment where both sides is taking a little bit of risk. And NASA has been great. In, and it's through NASA Ames, so we all know what that means. There's a little bit of innovation and willingness to push the edge of the envelope. And this is, um, it, it's, not a, it's not a gift, right? This is, this is actually uh, providing the mechanism for a small entrepreneurial company to hire NASA to help. And, and, and there's, but there's also a value proposition that NASA's obligated to identify where in helping enable a small company to commercialize the technologies that it's pioneered, also returns a future value in the way of being able to offer these technologies over and over again in a way that's more cost effective to the US tax player than if NASA had developed it themselves over and over again. So this is an experiment. Um, it's a, uh, uh, if, if it works, then um, we will have proven a business model that mitigates the risk of upfront R&D and all that capital investment is necessary, um, and, and leveraged uh, an incredibly innovative, brilliant team that worked internally at NASA, but is unable to take the step to commercialize because that's not what NASA does. So what's your satisfaction with it so far, and do you think it's scalable for the entire industry? Right, so uh, the, I'm very satisfied from the NASA perspective. Um, and the onus is on me right now to now take what we have and sell it to the investment communities that will say, yes, well, let's take another, now let's show that we're willing to step up and help move that contract along so NASA knows that given this little step, then this step will happen, the dance moves forward. The second part of your question was? Is it scalable to the entire industry? Can and we it is scalable. Can we a consortium of the entire industry and do this collectively with NASA right. and cost split a billion dollars of investment? Right, it is scalable because uh, uh, there's nothing exclusive about it. And if we're, we're smart, um, as a new space community, we'll be able to 
prove this model out and make it work more and more. So um, the arrows are in my back a little bit and in NASA's back a little bit because we're pioneering this structure. But um, that's fine. And, and hopefully that model will be adopted and adapted and move forward with other companies. We'll take you to our arrow doctor. Thank you very much. You, you don't even need to form an industry consortium to do it. You just need other people to step up and, again, make compelling propositions to NASA. That, maybe I'm making it sound too easy, uh, yeah. but it's... Well, I'd love to be on the panel and debate that with you, Esther, because I think you're wrong because you can't solve the political problem without the consortium. That's why. Well, you, can you can't solve the political problem without the scale. It's not easy to do this. I shouldn't say that, like, you know, you can walk through NASA's gate and say, hey, I want to sign an agreement with you. It's not easy to do. I, 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 Gary's here with NASA Ames. I don't know if we can, if you can comment, Gary. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hand him the mic, but just one second. It, it, it needs an industry movement, but not necessarily a formal consortium. Well, it takes, for one thing, I find that uh, a lot of industry wants us to move a lot quicker than we can. And not in the way that NASA is set up currently, we can't approve a Space Act agreement at the center. If we could, we'd be a lot more efficient in that. It has to be approved by NASA headquarters, which has a totally different look at each agreement. And that takes an awful long time also. So um, as Bob knows, I, that particular agreement took an excruciating amount of long time. And even that, um, because NASA uses public funds in order to do its investment, it has public li uh, laboratories and everyone's uh, civil servants, it creates, in fact, a question I was going to ask the panel, which is exactly what is the proper role of NASA in creating, I mean, these kinds of opportunities? And it's never been very clear. It seems to change with what parties in, in power. Because I've been with NASA for 20 years, and I've seen it go up and down. We had the Office of Commercial Programs, and it went away. We had technology transfer centers that went away. And they come and go. But, you know, right now I would say um, that there's, a f there's more support for commercial uh, partnering at NASA than I've ever seen it in the last 20 years. And I really think it's a time to push that, to come in the door and ask for these kinds of partnerships while this environment is persisting. And maybe at some point it will become the normal way we do business. But I would be interested to hear about what the panel feels the proper role of government is in this. Just uh, uh, don't give the mic back yet. Uh, so you have to go to headquarters. Is the office of the chief technologist good enough? I mean, they seem to be very well, they're brand new. Kind of, I know, and they don't have their budget yet. And here, and f here's what we, <laughs> I'll give you a little bit more insight. So before, uh -oh. we, before we at Ames, who, who I feel that, uh, you know, we work at this quite hard, uh, before we're even allowed to negotiate a Space Act agreement, we have to ask headquarters for permission to, to do that negotiation. And we're not allowed to ask headquarters for permission until a director of a, of a mission directorate has sent us an email saying that they will support it. At so, least they don't need to write you a letter, just an email. Well, an email. <laughs> yeah, but, it takes, but this is the kind of level, because what we've done when we've tried to push things from the centers is that headquarters will say, well, where did this come from? You know, this isn't part of our program. This is going to take our resources. Are they going to use our labs? our people, we want our people to be doing this thing. How do they have time to do that? And so we have to go and convince that it's mutually beneficial. And this, this is what takes, makes the process last so long, is that you can't just say, God, this is a great idea, it's a win-win, because to everyone who's involved, which are a lot of people, including the lawyers, it's not that clear. And there's a fair amount of people whose position is to try to throw rocks at it and try not to, to let it in the door. Uh, as a member of NASA's advisory council, I have absolutely no power to do anything, but I could ask you to send me an email describing this process so that we can uh, give some advice about it. If I might, uh, 
you know, add, add something to it, it reinforce what Gary is saying there. It, it, I think KSC and Ames have been both pretty widely recognized for, for moving out on public-private partnerships. We have, I showed you one example, one with Exploration Park that we did on, uh, uh, you know, able to, that, generally these things involve, you know, use of land, government land, or use of government facilities or access to capabilities. And everything you said is true. I mean, it's extraordinarily frustrating the, the sort of the bureaucratic process you have to go through and then get go to corporate, you know, if you will, corporate NASA headquarters has an entirely different viewpoint of NASA assets and what should happen to them and 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 you know certain goals and targets for reducing our footprint and all that kind of stuff. Where I want to introduce a seed of a of an issue or at least of an opportunity and an issue on what to do with repurposing NASA's extensive inventory of, of facilities, capabilities, and equipment that could be repurposed to support the commercial space industry. You know, taxpayers have invested billions over the years, not just at Kennedy Space Center, the facilities I showed you that we're trying to transition, but all, all across the agency. And so as we go through the retirement of shuttle, you know, some will be just trying to, to go as fast as they can to disposition all that stuff. Uh, when, in fact, you know, many of the people sitting out in this audience in a commercial space industry, you know, can really use that. It's already been paid for. And, and we can, as a, as a matter of national policy or, or you know, initiative, repurpose that. And, and a lot of that would be through public-private partnerships. We did one at KSC a year ago that got a GSA property award on bringing in a partnership with our state's leading utility to do a 10 megawatt renewable energy project on KSC property, and we got, we got power out of the deal. You know, instead of taking land rent payment value, we were able to negotiate an arrangement where we got even more solar panels, that some of which were dedicated to KSC's use. Uh, again, I had to go through the process, and it's very—it's more painful than it should be. Uh, but uh, essentially, NASA centers do not have local autonomy and authority over the management of their resources. I, I, just, want, I just want to make one more point. We've had a lot of people in Silicon Valley want to partner with us on energy and biofuels and things like that. For instance, on that one, there's not a good place at headquarters who says that I own that. We've had a really hard time following through on those, those agreements. Some of them have gotten through, but it's very, very difficult life sciences because there's not a group at headquarters, or ESMD to a certain amount, who have a life science charter any longer. So when someone comes in and wants to partner with us in areas that don't have exact good fits, it's really difficult. Brad, how are we doing on time? Yes, sir. I just wanted to add my perspective, which is along that, from the bottom of NASA. I'm a, I've been a 30-year contractor at NASA Ames Research Center. And again and again, you come to, so I've, people, I've tried to help people who come to NASA have this good idea. If it, it doesn't matter if it's a great idea for NASA. If it, doesn't, if it isn't for that little piece of NASA, it's an ixnay. So if you want to work with NASA, you have to find the piece of NASA. It's not good enough to go to NASA and say, this is great. You have to find that little piece of NASA somewhere in the bureaucracy that actually fits with what you do. And I can't tell you the number of great things that have not happened because I was not in the right part, right piece of NASA at one time or another. <coughs> Any final comments? Well, I'd like to thank our panelists. Uh, Esther, I'm glad that we have you on the NASA Advisory Panel Council. Um, yeah, like everybody who has yeah. no power. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Bob, like to thank you, uh, Jim as well. Um, for those who are interested in any additional information on uh, the European Commission, uh, Will Pomerantz wrote that up in a great blog article a couple of days ago. Uh, I'd also just like, as a footnote, to uh, close our conversation, point out that XCOR was a receiver of SBIR funds very early in its, in its development. It's, it's not that I think they're evil. It's simply that it, long run, it's, it's even better to be able to sell something somebody wants. SBIR funds are great, especially in healthcare, where it's, it's a, it, if you think the space market is bad, try health. Uh, 
it's not a commercial market. Anyway, sorry, thanks. Okay, well, thank, please thank our panelists. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will now break for a networking break for 30 minutes. Please return promptly at uh, 3.45, and we'll start a War Stories panel with some of our space entrepreneurs. Thank you. <laughs>